driving this presentation. Uh, before starting, I would like to know how many people in the room are playing with Node. Like, okay, there's, there's a lot. And how many played with JavaScript? All right, it's even better. All right, so uh, a little bit about me. So I've been like playing with the web uh, since uh, a long time, and I have a little bit of background in JavaScript and PHP. Uh, nothing that I'm proud of, but it was like the most popular language like a decade ago. So I did a little bit also of uh, Django and Rails, um, and I worked a lot with uh, Node.js lately, and I think it's a pretty cool uh, platform language to work with. And lately I've been transitioning to Elixir, and I've made my first project with Elixir, so I made the backend of uh, this little application, which is an iOS application to play bridge with your friends. And uh, it was actually a great fit to make the backend of this application with Elixir because I had to deal with concurrency and it was very, very nice. So our journey will start with uh, comparing like Node.js and Elixir and we'll find out what they have in common and we'll see a use case with uh, the uh, microservice architecture and then we'll see like how Elixir can help. So what do they have in common? Actually, um, they both run in server side, so in the back end. So they're both good for APIs, for example. Also for WebSocket handling, for chat applications, example, or dealing with uh, thousands of concurrent requests. So they're very good also at taking advantages of I.O. So what makes the success of Node? Node is good because there's a lot of wasted time with I.O. And there's only one thread. And this one thread is like very important because everything relies on the event loop. So either if you're using callbacks, promises, or the new async await syntax, you are relying on the event loop. And what it is, it's like there's a queue, the event gets there, and you bind your code to the event, and then your callbacks get call, and then something happens. So you can have like thousands of connections happening at the same time. There can be a lot of going on, but it's still like in the one single thread. So as long as we are in the single thread scheme, everything is fine. Everything is good. We can deal with concurrency because there's no shared memory. It's like one thread. But there's a lot of way to break that, uh, that scheme. So one way is like one task may uh, take forever and jams everybody else. So that can happen. And uh, if it doesn't return to the event loop, then, well, you're stuck. Uh, one other challenge is like to scale horizontally. I'm not saying that's a problem. I'm not saying that it's not possible with Node. I'm just saying that it's a challenge because you are no longer in the one single thread scheme. So you have to deal with that. You have to deal that you can, you can have two connections that can happen at the same time on two different machines and that can happen. Also, if you split the application into many uh, concurrent thread, you are no longer in the single thread scheme. So we'll see an example here. Let's, ha let's say that we have three teams. Maybe they are working at uh, Shopify, I don't know. So those three teams are building like dedicated software and they are squads actually. And they are uh, working on different aspects of one software. And they are very good at it. So uh, they work in parallel. And finally, how do we merge um, their work? How do they merge their work? So that's the question. So one person may say like, okay, we'll make like one single thread Node.js application and it's gonna run and it might be suitable for some uh, applications. But we see there that kind of architecture has a name and it's a monolith. And with monolith comes some problems, like it's tightly coupled and it's hard to maintain. And finally, like one task may crash the whole app. So that's not something that's really what we want. Instead of that, what we saw lately a lot, it's like teams develop their own APIs. So we can have three APIs building by three, three teams. And thanks to this guy, like you probably know, know it, it's Docker. So they can um, deploy their APIs into the cloud. So this is uh, very nice. So now we have three APIs working in the cloud. And um, so that's cool. We have uh, microservice architecture here. But there's still a problem here. Like what if an API crashes or doesn't respond? 
So we still need like to supervise it, to control it, and to orchestrate it. So we need to build code, we need something, we need other tools to make those APIs alive and also to monitor them and to control them. So here's some issues that uh, I saw with the microservice architecture. We are in a defensing programming um, scheme. So any code, internal or external, can crash the app. So that's the way. So we have to catch the exceptions. We have to catch the errors. Uh, also, scaling horizontally, like we saw, it's a challenge because we are no longer in the single thread scheme. And deployment is complex. Well. Think there's a lot of tools that are for there, but it's like orchestration, uh, it's like a distributed system, and it's difficult to, uh, to maintain. In productions, we know things will go wrong. And also implementing PubSub, I saw that there's a lot of like tools with Node.js. Uh, lately, I saw something like deep streams and uh, stuff like that, but it, it always needs a broker or something else to work, and I thought it was like a bit difficult to implement. So now let's see how Elixir will work. So Elixir works with processes, and those processes are not OS processes. They are lightweight, they don't need any luck, and they are isolated from each other. So this is very important. There is no shared memory with a process between two processes in Elixir, and this is very great. So we can have thousands and even thousands of thousands of processes that can coexist on one single machine, which is very great. Also, two processes can exchange data. So when they exchange data, they send a message. And when the message is sent, like the data is copied, it is not shared. This is very important. So, and also, this is the way to achieve like async with Elixir. So when one process sends a message, it doesn't block. It doesn't wait for the message to be sent. It's just like the message is sent in the mailbox of the other process, so the process can uh, continue to do things. So we see like a parallel with Node. Like Node, we have the event loop, where, while here we exchange messages. I see that like there's a parallel between those two. So we have no shared memory, this is great. That means we have concurrency. We have a full concurrency uh, platform to do like great application, distributed applications. This is uh, thanks to immutability. And if like you play with immutability before, maybe you are, because coming from uh, JavaScript, there's the immutable.js, which is a great library. So it's not something specific to Elixir. You can already use that in JavaScript. But if you're not used to immutability, like you may say like, well, it would lead to poor performance because I need to copy the data every time I want to send data to another process. And it's gonna be slow and complicated. So you might say that, but actually, if you have already played with immutability, you will see that it's less error prone and also the code is easier to read. And it would make your code easier to test and also it will make your life simpler. Really, and also it is not that slow. The way that Elixir implemented it, it was very, very nice. And of course, it is not as fast as mutable states, but it is very, it is very nice. So let's talk a little bit about the Erlang Beam uh, virtual machine. So everything that I talk, like processes, immutability, and everything, like it all comes from the Beam machine. It's a virtual machine, and it's like the machine that dispatch and uh, handle all those processes. So we can see that like as uh, like uh, the Node.js V8 machine, and also it comes like the Beam machine was made for Erlang at uh, the at the first time, but Elixir compiles to the Beam machine by code, so we can use that machine. Also, that machine can run on any OSs, and also uh, it's production ready and mature for more than 30 years. So we're taking like advantage of all the experience, all the optimization uh, that has been made on this uh, machine, and I think this is a great thing. 
also the processes they can live on multiple cores so the the beam machine will handle if there's a lot of processes it can dispatch it on different cores so this is very nice because that's something that if you want to uh, use many cores with Node.js we need to span a new process a new thread and uh, that are or use other strategies but the beam machine allows us to do that uh, and it's like under the hood like we don't have to to deal with that also, you can have multiple physical machines running the Beam machine, and those machines can communicate over the network, and you can actually have two processes that are on two different machines, and they will communicate with each other as if they were on the same machine, and I think this is very nice. Finally, with the Beam machine, we have hot code swapping, and what that means, that means that we don't have to take down the machine while we deploy the code, which is also a very nice feature. So in Elixir, we have workers and supervisors. It's two kinds of processes. Like most of the time, processes do nothing. They're waiting for messages. And they're waiting like to do something. And then we receive a message, then they do something. Ah, OK, I'll do something. So most of the time, we have workers. But we have also supervisors. Supervisors, they link uh, another process. So if the process crash, it will crash eventually. So we are, the, the, the supervisor gets notified, and then it can react on that. Do I start another process? Do I have to recover it? Do I have to take another state of what do I do? So there's multiple strategy, uh, recovery strategies that exist in Elixir, and it is very nice. And it's like very um, common to see a tree uh, of supervision among those uh, processes. And you can have a supervisor that super supervise another supervisor, and so on. So we have a very reliable system. Also, what I find very important with Elixir is application composition. Remember those APIs that we were talking about earlier? Well, now they are combined in one application. They are separate applications, but I can now make one application, what we call the number application, and it's like this application will handle like what if API 1 crashes or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So we can have external and internal dependencies like kind of like NPM, but it's kind of different as we will see. So I'm talking about dependency management, and it's made with NPM, with the Node.js uh, environment. And the M in Node.js stands for module. Uh, while in Elixir, like, we have mix that handles those dependencies. But in Elixir, we are not importing code. Sometimes you will want to import code, but sometimes you are importing an application. And while you are importing this application, it's something that is very nice. This application will run their processes inside the Beam machine, and you don't need to be aware of that. And I think this is very important from Node. Like, you are not just importing code, you are importing an application. Like, this is a mix file, so um, it's pretty, pretty small, but um, actually every product has a mix file. So uh, this mix file, uh, you see it's pretty much like a package that's JSON, in, uh, but it, there's two key differences. The first one, but that they are similar because in my project, I see that I'm defining like my project, what is the version, uh, which is, what is the version of Elixir that do I need, and also the dependencies. So it's pretty much like the JSON, uh, package of JSON. Uh, but here, like where I define my application, I say, okay, here are the other applications that I need in my application to be running. So this is very important. And also this is code. This is not a JSON file. This is not a data file. This is code that's going to be compiled and it's going to be run. It's going to be one of the first things that's going to be run uh, for my application. So we saw uh, also, oh, sorry about that. Uh, okay, for the web server now, if you have used Express, you'll see that it's going to be very easy to understand how it works with Elixir. Because in Elixir, we use Cowboy, which is the HTTP layer, and we use Plug, which is like a synonym for middleware. So there's a plug for to deal with ethers. There's a plug to deal with security. There's a plug to deal with authentication and stuff like that. So it's pretty much the same thing. And you'll see like the code very resemble. Also, there's library to work with WebSockets. And if you want to work with MVC, like Phoenix is a very, very great package. And it comes like with a lot of features. And I used it uh, for Bridge at Home. It was very nice. 
finally pops up it comes also out of the box uh, with phoenix which is very great and if you want to use like a data layer ecto is a very nice package but like nicholas said it's a little bit um, different from other orarians so it's very uh it, it, it's a bit different it takes like some learning curve finally i'll talk a little bit between those two languages and to me it's not I don't like to compare languages because the, it's, it's, it's very different. It's not, to me, like the comparison is more about how they run on the machine and not the language itself. But let's do the comparison. Like there have been a, bit, a myth about JavaScript like years ago and people were saying, well, okay, so you do JavaScript so you can do Java. And we we'll say like mostly they were recruiters. And, um, <laughs> Actually, uh, JavaScript is not Java, it's very resemble, but it's not the same thing. It's something very, very, very different. And it's the same, there's a myth also with Elixir that it's come from Ruby, and this is not Ruby. It's very like similar to Ruby, but it's not the same thing at all. Also, JavaScript is object-oriented and functional, while Elixir is only functional and not object-oriented. Are we losing something here? Mm, not really. I think that we can achieve the same thing as object-oriented, like encapsulation and stuff like that uh, with Elixir. In uh, JavaScript, you have symbols. And in Elixir, you'll see that it's atoms. It's very the same thing. Uh, JavaScript, you have the arrow function. In Elixir, it's like anonymous function. It's the same thing also. And in JavaScript, you have now something that is called destructuring. And it's almost similar to something that is very, very important in Elixir. And it's called pattern matching. And it's a very key feature of Elixir. I'm not saying that it's the same thing. I'm just saying that if you know what is destructuring, you will kind of like feel like, okay, it's kind of like pattern matching, but it's not the same thing, actually. Both languages have uh, rich data structures, and you just need to learn them. Like, it's very easy. Um, both languages have functional features, and you, you use that a lot with Elixir. And maybe in the near future, uh, JavaScript will take some feature from Elixir, like protocols, macros, module attributes. They are from the Python, actually, and Sigils, and I, I pass. There are so many more. Uh, and those features, you don't need to learn them at first. They're just like tools that are in the toolbox. And it's uh, very nice features. And so, like Elixir is a very rich language to make, like, and there's a lot of abstraction layers, so it makes like very good uh, code. Um, let's go back to the uh, challenges that we had. Uh, I, we talked about defensive uh, programming. Well, in Elixir, we say let it crash. Okay, so we are not in defensing, defensing programming anymore. Um, this is very good. Uh, scaling horizontally, well, it's a breeze with Elixir. And uh, deployment, orchestration, etc. it comes out of the box of OTP and with Elixir supervisors and stuff like that. It helps a lot to make great um, ecosystem. And finally, pops up, it's coming also in Elixir with Phoenix. So in conclusion, I would say that Elixir is a powerful and a beautiful language. It's way better than Erlang in my opinion, so it makes it like a very uh, a nice language to do applications. And we're taking advantage of all the cool features of the OTP Beam machine. So I think also that's very, very nice. It has a great community and it's great to build strong, fault-tolerant, distributed, scalable and concurrent application. And you might say, well, okay, so that's great to, um, to build games, a game backend, something like that. Well, to me, like the web is very in its nature uh, distributed. So uh, to me, uh, any world class, business grade web application where you need APIs, strong APIs, um, so any web application can be made with Elixir. And this is what I wanted to, uh, to show with this presentation. So I would like to thank you, everybody, and uh, I will take some questions if you have.